This is the Science Bloggers Podcast, the show where we talk to science communicators about science and how they get their message across. My guest this week is Dr. Maya Byfield. She's a biology professor, and she's also the founder and director of The Phenomenal STEMist, a business whose goal is to get more minority students involved in STEM. So, hello, Maya. How are you? Hey, I'm fine. Thanks for having me on your podcast. It's great to have you. Why don't we start? You can tell my listeners about you and, and what you do. Okay, so my name is Dr. Maya Byfield. I received my bachelor's in biology and minored in chemistry from Oakland College, now university. It's a historically black college in Huntsville, Alabama, United States. And I loved science a lot. At first, I thought I was going to do pre-med, but um, I really got interested in research and science um, in college. And so I decided to do a PhD. So I was accepted at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and I received my PhD, my master's in PhD in biomedical sciences. The track was molecular pharmacology. So I'm, I'm really interested in science. I've been interested into it for a long time. After I did my PhD, I taught for a year and then did a postdoc in neuroscience at the University of Central Florida, um, their medical school. And now currently, I'm a professor of biology, tenured, and I started this new business to try to get more students, specifically minority students, interested in STEM. So I'm the founder and director of Phenomenal STEMist. That's my background. Just I love science. I love to teach it. I love to explain it. I love to do it. And I want more people to get an opportunity involved in it. What has been the reaction to starting this new venture? I started it a year ago and it's mixed. I'm just beginning in this business. I have different types of media. Uh, for specifically, I have a phenomenal STEMist uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel where I just get the information out to parents. My, my ultimate goal is to really teach parents how to develop uh, STEM students. And so they love watching my videos on Facebook. In terms of the business, in terms of creating an online classroom for students, that's moving a little slower. I'm doing all kinds of things to get young people involved in STEM, so I'm really excited about it. It sounds like something that's needed, especially when it comes to getting minorities involved in STEM. Biggest problem is like we are so underrepresented in yeah. almost every field. Yeah. So it's it's great that, that you're doing this. Is there any reason you think that you're not getting the traction that you're, you're, not, you're getting? I guess it's just the beginning. And I think different parents have different motivations for their children. I feel like STEM is heavily targeted to children. And I think that's one of the grave mistakes that we're doing when it comes to representation in minority communities. You can have children do all kinds of fun stuff in the classroom and camp, but if, if it's by the parents, it won't last. And so I got to the place where, you know, I, I go to tons of conferences. I go to at least one conference each year, and I've, I'm just tired of not being one of the few African-American people, female or male, uh, present in these conferences. So I feel like we've been targeting young people for a while in STEM, but I think now it's time to target the parents. I feel like you have to really push parents to, to make it a priority in their kids. And that is tough because parents have different priorities. They have to work, they have to take care of their kids, they have all kinds of extracurricular activities, and sometimes STEM comes below. So to convince the parent that this is a big deal, I think it will transition um, young people. I know how you feel, you know, at least in science communication, when I go to some of these conferences, and I, I go about like once, at least once a year, and I might be the only, you know, only person of color. And it gets pretty isolating in a way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know how that feels. Yeah. But on the parent side, what is it exactly that you think that they want for their kids that they are not encouraging STEM? You know, what, what are they prioritizing over? science education? 
I think extracurricular activities, sports, karate, things that are extracurricular. Out, so school is for school and then now it's time to do other things. I think those take the priority. Basically what the children like to do, what they enjoy doing, music lessons. I hear all kinds of things. Oh, I can't do it this week because X, Y, and Z. And I feel like parents have dreams for their children. Children have dreams for their children, but many don't know what it takes to become what they dream. So they'll say, oh, my, my child wants to be a pediatrician. My child wants to be an engineer. Well, it takes heavy levels of math, you know, early to be a engineer. And so if you're not putting them in math camps and trying to give them opportunities to learn coding skills and quick level math, they're not going to be prepared for it by the time they reach college. So somehow they feel like if they do well in school, then magically they just keep going to school, they'll become a doctor. And I'm trying to get them to understand it requires so much practice from from a very young age. Medical school, I, I talk to my friends and I do it in a podcast, they talk about how medical school is like trying to drink water from a hydrant using a straw. That's how much volume of information is coming at them. And it's something that they would have to have done over a period of time. They should have developed a discipline. They can't develop a discipline by the time they get to medical school. And so if, if I can teach parents that, if I can somehow get parents to understand that they need to be developing it that from that age, then... I think we've we've gotten half the battle. It sounds like this is is a cultural thing, at least in the U.S. Because I'm I'm an immigrant, and you know when I was a teenager, you know my my parents sent me to tuition after school, and mm -hmm. I didn't even really need that much help. I was doing well in my classes, you know, um, mm -hmm. especially in, in my maths and science classes. I was an A student, but they were sending me there even if I wanted to or not. And Absolutely. My parents are of Jamaican descent and the same thing. Like, it's not whether you're doing well, it's something that you're developing a discipline. Exactly. And the idea that you would be going to play football after school, that is not something they would have entertained. It's like, are you crazy? You want to do what? So I don't know. It's, it's an interesting, you know, cultural phenomenon that I haven't quite yeah, gotten in used this to. In this country, the ticket to greatness is through sports. But the reality is that's just the biggest myth I've ever heard, because the reality Based on just statistics and numbers, more African-American males excel in professional degrees than sports. Like you are more likely to become an engineer as a black man than a stick of stick of whatever sports <laughs> profession you think that you want to say. Right. I don't want to give any credit to any, you know, yeah. association, but. Right. Just pick any association, uh, professional sports association. It's more likely that a black man be a lawyer or or computer guy, IT professional than a f professional sports player. Yeah. Yet and still the, the myth is perpetuated that that's your way out of the hood. And it's not the way out of the hood is to become an IT guy. <laughs> Where you just you just go to school for you can even just go to school for an associate. You can go to a school for an associate's in information technology and and take yourself out of the projects. And if I can just get more um, people of color, especially African Americans in this country, to understand that at the parent level, um, we've I I really believe that will change will change the world. Yes, um, I agree, and I'm I'm not trying to say anything bad about athletic careers. Absolutely. When, when you look at the longevity of it, right. at some point, your body is not going to keep up. By the time you hit, say, 40, you know, you don't recover from injuries as well. The and that's cost, old. Yeah, you get, you get old, right? And 27. Like, let's be real. 25 years after you leave college, that's, you leave college around 22. So 27 is old. <laughs> right. We look at that, that dream, you know, you'll become a pro athlete, you'll get this multi-million dollar contract. Not many people do that. Not right. many people get that. You're more likely to get 
uh, a good paying job, you know, pursuing, you know, something in science, engineering, or computers. And mm. I think we need that fundamental shift in thinking for people to realize that. Yeah, and I believe it belongs at the parent level because parents will put their kids in these sporting teams from young, right? Never mind the the detriment that can happen to their body based on their developing brains and, and bodies. Like they're 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 paying money to put them in these camps. So so many of them can't afford STEM camps. They just have to have a shift in mindset. And I think they just have to be really informed a little bit more. And I feel like a lot of the times we're targeting the children and not the parents. The focus should be on on parents, you know, and mm. uh, I agree. So what type of classes do you give to, to children? Mm. So I've developed a, a online classroom that trains parents how to prepare their children in STEM from different levels. So from pre-K to 12th grade, I have three levels. The beginner is basically pre-K to third grade. The intermediate is fourth to eighth grade and then the advanced is high school and I teach the parents in terms of what programs to use what activities to do how to practice online at different levels so I believe that the foundation of science is physics so I so in three months they learn everything about physics at their level so even the pre-k they're learning about physics but it's just at their level right and then what's built on physics is chemistry so that the next three months is the basics of chemistry doing all kinds of assignments I even create labs that parents can create for their children at the house and they do chemistry and then after that biology and all the while they're practicing math I believe that we really need to give parents the fundamentals of STEM and teaching their children how to learn the fundamentals of STEM. Because a lot of the times I think many programs are fun and fluff. Let's make slime, you know, <laughs> everybody, that's a new thing right now. Everybody's making slime. And so it seems so fun, right? But they don't know the fundamentals of chemistry, like what is an atom and what is a molecule and etc. So I get to the basics and they learn and they learn everything is an online platform. I converse with them via video. You know, I can have this classroom teaching parents all across this country. And I have a couple of clients, you know, one is in Florida, one is in New York and I live in Florida and it's, it's really working well. I mean, I, I mean, I have a four year old and, you know, she, I was talking to the mom and, and she was saying, oh, my goodness, I was thinking it might have been too much because it was basically a video on graphs. And what's the difference between a, a line graph and a bar graph and a pie chart? And she was scared because she thought, oh, he's only four. But he was clicking the right answer and he was getting it right. And she's like she was amazed. So everything at their level, whether it's four years old or 14. Has response from parents been enthusiastic? Um, yeah, once the parents get it and start doing it, they love it, especially my homeschooling parents where they have more time to do it with their children. Man, it's just about getting the parents to do it. Once I get them to sign in, oh man, it's amazing. Oh, that's great because unless parents have that positive attitude towards it, kids aren't going to, to get it. They're going to pick up on it. They're going to be like, Oh, yeah. Science is too hard and it's just right. going to turn them away. Yeah. I always say this. I think the number one enemy of a future career for a child in STEM is a parent who hated STEM as a child. Right. They hated math and they bring that hate for it into the house. And some of them don't hate it. Some of them are afraid of it. They're really literally scared of it. They haven't learned math since eighth grade. And they and sometimes it's intimidating and embarrassing. You know, you feel for the parent because they feel that they can't help their child with their homework. Well, then that's my job, right? All you have to do is be firm. And every parent knows how to be firm. You know, you, you basically say, you're going to do what Dr. Byfield says. I don't care what you're doing, right? You don't have to say 5X um, equals 10X equals 2. You, you, like, you don't have to do the math, but you have to be firm as a parent to support me and support uh, the child doing their work. There's so many parents. I'm, sh I'm not sure. I don't know your parents' background, but a lot of our parents didn't have the background. What they did was they had the urgency for education and they really supported the teacher 
My mother didn't have, have a science background. Mm -hmm. I just showed that interest in, in science and she just, oh, if you want to do it, you know, I'll, I'll encourage you. Right. And that's where the extra classes came in, which is mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, you have to learn to do this. And my tutors were like, yeah, he knows, he understands your work. But it's not just going to be knowing the answers. He has to be able to express himself. He has to be able to... I think one teacher used to say is a lot of this is a language and he has to, to learn, learn the language of science. Right. Yeah, it was very encouraging. And, you know, I think that was the, the biggest influence. Because if, if you're in a high school class, you have dozens of other students, you're not going to get that attention that you need. Right. So, you know, I guess that's where people like you, what you're doing, that's what helps students grow. Yeah, it's a great supplement. And like even with the high school, the new wave of professions or the, the future of professions is emotional intelligence artificial intelligence like it's deeper than just them uh, many of the jobs that will take over in the future will require emotionally intelligent professionals and i have a part of my program for high school students is that it's not just and this is of course the advanced level but it's not just you know learning math and physics and biology but I teach them basically how, how to be financially intelligent, um, how to how to be emotionally intelligent and then learn about artificial intelligence because it's going to be a new day in the future. And there's so many people that know math, but don't know how to financially support themselves. So there's so many STEM people who, you know, they got did well in college. They got their STEM degree. They went on to become a physician or or engineer. And, and they're in horrible debt, right? Because they never learned how to handle their finances. So I think there should be a great component in financial intelligence and emotional intelligence at the higher levels. And so that's not taught, like you said, in the high school, but it's definitely needed. Yeah, it is. Let's talk about your, your podcast. Why, why are you doing a, a podcast? It actually started off as Facebook Live. Every Sunday, I do a video Facebook Live I guess you could call it a video podcast for pe people to understand different principles in STEM. It ranges from what my followers want to talk about. I've done This Is Your Brain on Drugs. So the whole month learning about a specific type of drug. Somebody wanted to know about marijuana. And so I, I basically talked about the biology of marijuana. One of my followers wanted to know if I believed in creation and, and different things in science to help me support my belief in creation. So I always talk about how I'm not a creationist, meaning I don't use science to prove creation, but I have a faith and different reasons scientifically why I, my faith is in creation. And I also did like an interview uh, session of, started off with black males, black male engineers, black male physicians, black male scientists, and just to show the kids of my followers that there are people of color in these industries and they can use them as role models. So I just started to interview for the pat for four months straight. Um, I also did females in March um, for, for Women's History Month. So I talked, you know, I had friends of mine who were dentists and physicians and clinical psychologists, and they were just great interviews. They're all on YouTube. And I, I figured, I said, well, I saw a couple of I think articles about how podcasts are really uh, coming up in the day. And so I said, well, let me learn how to do one. So I just taught myself how to create a podcast and I just trans transformed my, those interviews. I'm in the process of doing that. I just started it. I just began the Phenomenal Stemist podcast, but I'm basically transforming my videos into audio versions and placing them on podcasts because there are some people who don't watch YouTube, but they do listen. So I'm just taking everything that I I've done and putting it in different forms to get my message out there. And it's basically there is an end game. So many uh, people of color, they don't see physicians and engineers and computer scientists in their family. I know I did. My mother's side of the family, I have maybe about nine physicians. And I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not even talking about other professions, whether they be lawyers or uh, engineers. And so I constantly saw that growing up to the point where I knew I thought I was going to be a physician. It's just part of the family. So and I think that was pivotal in me believing that I, can, I could 
excel. So I did those video interviews so that students can see. So now I'm just transitioning them to audio so more people get get the message. It's a great idea to bring people of color into to interview and talk to them. But a few decades ago, probably in the 80s, they did this study of, of draw a scientist and almost every kid just draws this old white guy. Einstein, yeah. Yeah, Einstein. And oh, if, if you are into a lot of movies, you might draw Doc Brown from Back to the Future. So Okay. Who, who basically looked like Einstein? Yeah, Big hair. E- e- exactly. Right, right, right. <laughs> and popular culture has, has a lot to do with it, right? I mean, this is the image that we, we give to, to students, right? And in the process, we... We remove that history that other people that have played, right? So right. we remove women, remove people of color, and mm-hmm. that is detrimental to diversity in any field. And it doesn't just mean that, you know, we don't exist. It's just no one's talking about it. Right. And my father was really instrumental in making that known to me. He would always talk to me about George Washington Carver and Benjamin Banneker and Louis Latimer. Like he constantly put black mathematicians and scientists in my young age. Now, there weren't a lot of women. I didn't really learn about a lot of female scientists, but I just knew I loved it. I loved science for such a young age. And so I did have role models I saw. And I think if we could push that, like you said, now with more recent scientists and physicians, let kids know, let parents know, then more students would uh, be interested. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So what do you like the future of Phenomenal STEMIS to be? I envision just impacting so many young people. I, I envision them learning science and loving it from a young age. That's all I want. I want parents to develop a discipline in their children that leads them to love science at a young age so that they can themselves become phenomenal STEMists. So I, I, I came up with phenomenal STEMist. The word phenomenal always registers with me as being not average, but not good either. Not even great, but phenomenal. So many people settle, settle for good. You know, settle for great, settle for great. So, but when you're a phenomenal woman, my name is Maya Angelou. My father named me after Maya Angelou. And that poem from her, Phenomenal Woman, is is such a a powerful poem that always registered with me based on the fact that I was named after her. And I just want more young people to aspire to be better than good, but not just good, but phenomenal. STEMist is just, you know, it's, I saw it one day, I'm like, we're chemists, we're biologists, we're scientists. So we are STEMists. And I just want more and more young people to not settle for good, average, but I want them to be phenomenal STEMists. And so whatever I need to do, whether it be through podcasting, video, blogging, I do talks, I visit schools. Yeah, I'll I'll do it. But now I'm going to target the parents, for them to really train their children. Well, I, I hope it works out. I think it, it sounds like a worthy goal. And as we conclude, is there anything else you would like to say that you didn't get a chance to say? Um, I, No, just I appreciate being on your podcast. Just let your listeners know that you can find me in multiple places. I do my Sundays at seven o'clock on Facebook, Phenomenal Stemist. My podcast is on uh, Apple Podcast and Google Podcast, Phenomenal Stemist. <laughs> I have a website, www.phenomenalstemist.com. I look forward to hearing from more parents and their interests. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It was great having you, and I'll put all those links in the show notes. Sure. YouTube channel as well, Dr. Maya Byfield. All right. I'll <laughs> just be sure to send them to me and I'll, I'll put them in. All right. And appreciate it. Thank you again. That was Dr. Maya Byfield. If you'd like to learn more about Maya and what she's trying to do, check out the Phenomenal STEMIS podcast and blog. Links have been provided in the show notes. And thank you for joining me. This concludes the first season of the Science Bloggers podcast. If you enjoyed this show, Tell your friends and colleagues about us and encourage them to subscribe or leave a comment. We'll be returning in 2019 and I hope you'll join me as I talk to a new science communicator.